but welcome to the November 1st meeting of the Community Preservation Committee. Uh, we have about two hours of agenda items, and we'll get to you folks. Uh, so our only agenda item uh, for this evening is to hear uh, from you speak either in support or against some of the different projects that we have on the docket for uh, this particular um, fall uh, uh, session of, of, of CPC. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking all of you for coming out tonight. It's great to have a show of support or lack of support for some of the different <laughs> projects. Um, we'll do our best to hear from all of you. Uh, folks with uh, baseball anxiety, it doesn't start to reach <laughs> a little ways to go, but it's not the Red Sox, so we don't really care. <laughs> uh, one thing is, uh, I would like to acknowledge that um, this, this is difficult for people to get up in front and speak. Some of you may get anxious or nervous, and we appreciate that. We will ask when you speak to come up to the podium, uh, if you are able to, uh, to state your name and your address, and then uh, acknowledging that there's so many of us, so many folks who would like to speak, be uh, perhaps as concise as you are able to. Uh, you are welcome to sit through all and hear from, uh, from everybody. You're also welcome once you speak to leave, and folks in back standing would probably uh, appreciate that. But, uh, but you're, you're certainly welcome to stay for the, for the entire meeting. Uh, given the number of speakers here, I sort of doubt that we will get to our deliberations. You're always welcome to come and listen to those. Two weeks from tonight on the 15th, is that right? We'll be meeting again, and uh, we may begin our deliberations um, this evening, but, but may be waiting until the 15th. So as always, you're welcome to come to any or all of those meetings. Uh, one thing that I would like to acknowledge and that you need to hear is that we have uh, somewhere around three million dollars in requests for this round. We have somewhere around 900,000 to spend for two rounds, for a fall and a spring. Um, so those of you that are speaking in support of projects, if it does not get funded, in no way does it mean it's not a worthy project, that, is, that we don't support it, that we don't think it's wonderful, that it's not something that should be done. It's simply a matter of not having enough money to fund fully or perhaps even partially all of the projects. That also doesn't mean that um, applicants can't come back again and again and again for, uh, to ask for, for funding. But again, let me just reiterate that. We have somewhere around 900,000 for the, this fall and the spring. And for this fall, we have somewhere close to three million in, in request. So that is our challenge as a committee. And so we, we hope you are understanding of that. Um, before we get going, if I can just get a brief show of hands to see who is speaking in support of, I'm sorry, in support of which projects. And maybe if there's only one or two on one project, we'll get those folks to come first. We don't have to sit through the, 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 the lots of folks. I'm not sure how best to do this. But let me just go down the list, and if you could just wave your hand, if you're <coughs> speaking again for or against this project, if you're speaking for multiple ones, then your hand will go up a few times. Um, the Greenfield Avenue Habitat for Humanity. It's not on Greenfield Avenue, but Garfield Green, Avenue. Garfield, thank you. Uh, miss, I can't read my own writing. Um, Glendale Road Habitat, okay. Uh, Village Hill Apartments, uh, Sargent House, uh, the Academy of Music, uh, oh, the uh, Mineral Hills, the Rocky Hill Open Space Acquisitions, uh, Community Housing Supportive Services, uh, St. John's Church, Oh. Wow. Oh. <laughs> and the conservation oh. fund. Okay, so this was really wasn't helpful at all. <laughs> okay, other than uh, St. John's, St. John's, you win uh, in terms of numbers of folks. Um, but other other than that, there's there's uh, uh, there are a lot of a lot of ones to go through. Suggestions from the committee should go with 
Anybody has a question for me? No, no, no. Okay, I think we're going to go right down the list that I that I just. Uh, I mean, St. John's would be last. Let's go with St. John's first, and because uh, um, that's the majority of the people, and then they would not have to sit. I, I think maybe that that makes the most sense. Does anyone before we get going on specific projects? We we open every meeting uh, for general public comment. So if you have a general comment about anything to do with the Community, Pre yeah, community Preservation Committee uh, that does not have to do with this specific project, now is your chance to come and speak to that. So anyone here for general public comment? Okay. Uh, so St. John's um, uh, is the first one. And however folks want to do it, you can just figure it out yourself. And again, your name, your address, if you have a particular title, that might be helpful. And again, thank you for coming. My name is Christina Peterson. I live at 331 Birds Pit Road in Florence. And I'm speaking for my husband, three children, and the congregation of St. John's, many of which are here. We've been members of St. John's congregation since 1993. Our children are now grown, and St. John's played a huge role in their spiritual development. Along with the remarkable public school system in Northampton, St. John's taught them how to become intelligent and compassionate adults. St. John's is now 125 years old, and it needs help. While the congregation is excited about our second century campaign and have given of both labor and money, we now turn to the city for the first time in 125 years for some help. Specifically, we need an elevator and other enhancements to improve accessibility and space for our congregation and for the many community groups that use the church. We need to update plumbing and the electrical system so we can install a new sprinkler system. Then we will all be safe when we use the building. St. John's has undertaken various improvements over the years, always with an eye towards historical factors. We took up the carpet to restore the hardwood floors, we worked with a historic paint conservationist when we painted the sanctuary. We restored the organ, a huge project funded fully by the congregation. We restored the stained glass windows that face Elm Street. Recently, we opened the drop ceilings on the second floor and found a spectacular vaulted ceiling, which will be part of the renovation. Our Romanex structure, built of Massachusetts granite and featuring a bell tower and honest-to-goodness gargoyles, is truly one of the architectural treasures of Northampton, and that's why our renovation will change all sides of the building except for the facade. Keeping St. John's from deteriorating is important to the ongoing efforts <coughs> of beautification in the Elm Street Historic District. We only need to look at the abandoned St. Mary's Cathedral to see what might happen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good evening. My name is Pellegrin Gonzalez. I live at 310 Elm Street, and I'm here to speak for myself and my partner in life, Dr. Neil Chuang. I am here to support St. John's Church in their decision to continue to serve the community with the use of their historic building. In the six years since I entered St. John's doors, I have seen how they struggle with their ancient kitchen as they reach out to those in need by providing meals through their MANA program. They serve hot meals several times every week. They also serve Thanksgiving and Christmas dinner to walk-ins and people who are homebound. I want to see that improved. St. John's also helps feed the soul by providing concert events throughout the year. I have seen the sanctuary filled with people for various functions, such as concerts by the Pioneer Valley Acapella Group, the Gay Man's Chorus, the University of Massachusetts Choir, my favorite, <laughs> First Night, and Love and Chocolate, just to name a few. St. John's Church also offers a meeting place for special needs Scouts of America, which includes Scouts ranging in age as young as 16 to well into their 70s. They are the home for many different 12-step recovery programs, which is helping countless people in our community with addiction. The biggest priority for the staff and clergy of St. John's Church is to provide a safe place for everyone in the community to worship, fellowship, and partake in God's graces. 
Sometimes as I lock up after an event, I look at the beautiful old wooden ceiling and think if there was ever a fire, it would be a disaster. With your help, they can make it a safer place by being able to install better electricity, newer and safer electricity. I have seen firsthand people who try to get down the stairs and they are unable because of lack of wheelchair access. With your help, they can install an elevator which would allow everyone, regardless of physical ability, to partake in everything offered. This building is 126 years old and it needs your help to last another 226 years. Our community needs a safe place to be. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Don Robinson. Uh, I moved to Northampton in 1966 and lived in Northampton for about uh, 35 years or so. Moved then to Ashfield, where I live now, Ashfield, Massachusetts. Uh, I am here, I've been a member of St. John's since I moved to town in 1966, and so I speak with that uh, historical uh, perspective on the, on the application that they have submitted here. I want to address uh, a couple of, well, two, three questions in particular that, the, that your group raised of our application and uh, try to speak specifically to those issues. The uh, first one had to do with uh, whether, we, why we are focusing our application to you on the sprinkler system. And the reason for that is that the sprinkler system is essential to the preservation of that building. We have worked very carefully with the fire department uh, in designing the sprinkler system. Uh, and we have uh, taken their advice, obviously, very carefully in terms of how to do that to preserve that building. That is essential for us. And it, the need for that arose from the fact that once we decided to build an elevator to increase accessibility for all members of the community, it raised then questions of, uh, of other things that would be needed in the building. In particular, the, the protection of that building, that essential piece of the uh, historic uh, aspect of Elm Street. Uh, we needed in particular to make sure that it was fireproof for as near so as we could make it. And so despite uh, the difficulty of doing that in a building with an organ in it, and, and making sure that it, the organ, which is so essential uh, to, the, uh, to the value of the building, uh, that, uh, that we, had to, we had to build that, that sprinkler system with great care. So that is at the center uh, of the application that we have submitted for your consideration. Uh, the other thing, as I mentioned a minute ago, was that the asbestos removal is very important too. Once we decided that we had to do various uh, renovations of the kitchen <coughs> and of the uh, elevator for access purposes, it became clear that we were going to have to remove some asbestos. And that was, a, that was something unavoidable uh, for us to do once we opened up the question of, of uh, making the changes we had to make and thereby coming under various code requirements here in, uh, in Northampton. And so we, uh, we have removed the asbestos uh, as required, or we are in the process of removing it uh, as required. Uh, the, and um, and uh, we will have to complete that part of the project too. The other question that you raise is one that interests me a good deal, and that is the question of whether public funds should be used for a religious building. As we know from uh, editorials in the Gazette and elsewhere, uh, that is an essential question for us to face and to, to, uh, to resolve if we can. Uh, in addressing that, the application notes data regarding the number of people who use the building. It is used 
heaven knows by members of the congregation for worship and other spiritual needs. But it is used by many more people in, num in terms of numbers from the community who are not members of the worshiping community uh, at St. John's. So it is definitely a community asset. And it is a fact, for example, we've heard mention of the MANA program. That is a program that serves many, many people uh, who are hungry in town, regardless of their religious affiliation. Uh, similarly with other programs at the church uh, that are made clear in the, in the application. Those services are performed without reference to religious affiliation. And m I dare say most of the people who use that building numerically are in fact not members of the Episcopal Church, not members of St. John's, not members of the religious community at all, but who would come to, to use the facility that we have. We are very anxious that that, that continue to be true. It's a community space, uh, which is in fact owned by the Episcopal Church, but it is of value and use to the community. The, the case for the uh, for the project <clears throat> is made best, I think, in, in summary, in short summary, by the letter from uh, David Drake uh, at the conclusion of the application. He notes the unanimous approval of the historic commission, uh, 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 brother or sister body to, to this group. Uh, and he concludes by saying to allow the church to be effectively utilized moving forward, this project deserves support. Uh, it is a project which is significant to the history, archaeology, architecture, and culture, and culture of this city. And I encourage you and hope that you, I, I'm sure you will give it careful consideration, and I hope you will find it possible to support the application from St. John's. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good evening. My name is Frank Evans. I live at 120 Maplewood Terrace in Florence. Uh, I've been associated with St. John's since 1970 when I moved here from uh, Arlington, Virginia, where I served Pentagon. Uh, in January 1977, I started a special needs scout troop in conjunction with the Hampshire County Arc. Uh, Father Tyler from St. John's gave us permission to meet in the Undercroft, where we still meet. While the troop was originally intended for the disabled of Hampshire County, we now serve all four counties of Western Massachusetts. I'm here to support St. John's with their quest to continue to serve our community with the use of their historic building. And, uh, as a side note, in addition to volunteerism, I've recently retired after 33 years as a forensic chemist and fire investigator. The scout store supplies downstairs near the stone walls, which periodically uh, leak and need repair. We also use the kitchen for training, and some <coughs> and some some of our scouts volunteer with the MANA program. The kitchen needs to be modernized in order to serve the meals to the uh, hungry and homeless uh, more effectively and more efficiently. N numerous of our scouts over the years have been in wheelchairs and in order to get them into our meeting space, we had to either carry them down and then up the stairs or carefully and two people roll them up and down and then up the stairs uh, in their wheelchairs. And my back, for one, will be very happy to have an elevator <laughs> installed. I've attended services, funerals, and many other events in, at the church, but the sanctuary was full of people. While well, wooden supports and ceilings are exquisite, I sometimes wonder how fast it would all come, become char and ash without proposed sprinkler system and if it were occupied at the time St. John's makes this space available to the community not only for scouts but for many other groups such as recovery groups, the soup kitchen 
midnight breakfast for Smith students during exams, and much more. Before there were shelters, there was a program at St. John's where space was provided for the homeless to sleep on mats in the undercroft. And St. John's is a regular supporter of the Survival Center, and when my home burned down in 1979, all the excess donations my family and I were unable to use were donated to the Survival Center, which helped to get operating as a community resource. Uh, it's the first initial big slug of things that the uh, Survival Center got. And St. John's is committed to the community and to the safety of all who use the building. <coughs> the aid of this grant, they will be able to better serve the community, preserve the beautiful granite building, and to do so in a much safer way. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Joan Griskowski. I'm a resident, uh, resident of Hatfield. Um, and I come before you as the former manager of the soup kitchen for St. Elizabeth Ann Seaton. At the beginning of August, I received a phone call that the next day would be our last day as a soup kitchen because the parish hall was closing. And um, needless to say, that was a, a shock. Um, there were, I guess, code violations that needed to be dealt with. Um, I immediately went to um, MANA and I asked Carl Erickson, the executive director, if he could help because I didn't want our people to um, be hungry on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, and he immediately said, let me call Lee Anderson from um, St. John's. And without even blinking, he said, yes, we will do Tuesdays and Thursdays for you. Now, <coughs> What I asked was Tuesdays and Thursdays until um, the parish hall could be fixed. But then <coughs> issues arose and I asked, can you do Tuesdays and Thursdays forever and ever? And, ever? <laughs> <laughs> and again, without even blinking, the answer was yes. They are a welcoming community to all, not only the marginalized, but to anyone in the community of Northampton, and I love them dearly. So I, I hope that because um, they are such a welcoming um, group, that you will consider community dollars for all of those things that are, are served in the community. Um, and I am very grateful to them for keeping my babies fed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. My name is uh, Grant Moss, and I have been the college organist at Smith since 1983, so I've been in town for a long time. I live at 101 Pearl Street in South Hadley. Um, but one of the second hats I wear, I have several, um, is as organist at St. John's. I've been there, I believe, seven years now. And though I can't any add anything much new about the fact that there is an organ there, I can say that it's largely the original historic pipe work from 1895 or six. And I can tell you that if it needed to be replaced, it would be something like $1.4 million. So it's a huge um, outlay of money if the place were to go up in smoke. Um, the uh, organ was recently renovated about 10 or 12 years ago, and that was paid for completely by the, by the parish. And it would be a shame to lose it, and I would hate to lose my job as organ. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great, it's a wonderful place. The organ is used obviously for worship services. We also have a concert grand piano and another six foot piano. Um, so we do concerts, the annual Messiah Sing, which is always a full house, the Illuminati Singers, UMass, and all the other groups that Pele has already mentioned. So it's a very busy place, and 
because a lot of the work that has to be done, the elevator, the kitchen, and everything, <coughs> the building has to be brought up to code, so a lot of things have to happen. And I would hate to see a beautiful historic room like the sanctuary be marred by a less than wonderful job of sprinkling. It would be a shame to ruin the visual aspects of it. But mostly we want to protect it. That's all I have. Thanks. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Todd Weir. I live at 124 Moser Street here in Northampton. And uh, I'm also pastor of First Churches here in downtown Northampton. And I want to speak for St. John's tonight because they're our partner. We do many things together. We have a joint youth group together, and we're stronger because we do things together. And uh, when I uh, see the people here, I see a lot of people I know because they, they help at the homeless shelter and they run the feeding programs, and our people all volunteer at many of the same places. And, and what that means to me is all of our religious institutions downtown, it's, it's a seamless web. Uh, we may host um, similar programs or different programs, but we're always communicating with one another, trying to figure out what are the gaps in services, uh, what are the needs, and so if they're stronger, we're stronger. And I know what a difference your funding <coughs> makes. Um, if you saw the paper this morning, you saw our window going in, thank you very much. And not only is that remarkable historic preservation, and, and their church has um, similar kinds of wonderful historic qualities. But when you take that off a community's back, it means they can do more for the rest of the community. I know since I spoke to you last and we received funding, uh, we probably have 30% more groups using our building. And part of that is we were able to um, expand our services, we have the confidence to do so, and it just took a weight off our congregation. So we could be stronger, and, and again, it's, it's a web, and we're all interlocking, and uh, I hope that they get this chance as well. Um, I wish I could come and give you metrics of, you know, you know I'll, I'll talk about housing later, and I can talk about dollars leveraged and, you know, economic research and things like that. It's hard to do for a church. You know, we can tell you how many people go through our buildings in a day, and we're probably some of the most used square footage in the entire community. Um, but what I hope you'll also take into account is um, many of the people who use the services in our um, religious houses of worship, those services don't have any other place to go. Um, we offer free and affordable, very uh, cost-effective places for all the 12-step groups and um, you know, there's just a lot of programs in this community um, that couldn't happen. So really, there is a tremendous amount of leverage that ripples throughout the whole social service community um, when some of the capital uh, infrastructure needs of our congregations are helped out um, by you folks. So thank you for all you do, and good luck with your tough decisions, and uh, I hope you can help St. John's out. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Carol Vincy. I live in Huntington, Mass, and I am a user of St. John's Church. One example was I'm a member of a 20-piece drumming ensemble, very loud, and only St. <laughs> John's gave us a place to, <laughs> to rehearse on a weekly basis. Um, arts groups, music groups, uh, the 12-step, there was a huge array of groups that find a home in that building that they can't find elsewhere. I would like to echo what was just said, that you know, government doesn't provide and corporations don't provide. There, isn't, there is a group of folks who need affordable community space. These folks are community activists. They you know, have sponsored immigrants. They run these 12 steps and this, these scout troops and on and on and on, which I was very impressed once I became the architect for the project. Um, <laughs> to learn exactly how much they contribute to, to the community. It is a community resource, that building historically, fantastic, you know, historic stained glass windows and architecture um, that needs to be preserved, but 
preserved and used, well used as well as preserved. Um, and I think the St. John's community is doing that to the nth degree. They are serving the community. I felt welcomed there as a user. I felt um, not harassed to, to become a religious person or anything like that. I mean, it's, they are doing fantastic work there. And I hope that you um, provide a little bit of assistance to them because the request was pretty modest. An elevator and a new, a new kitchen to give dignity serving the folks who are homeless and low income their meals and other communities. But that triggered a new electrical service, complete fire, fire sprinklers, all sorts of things, new sewer pipes, etc. So all their good work is, all their good money is going into things that are going to be hidden. Um, and we want to do those things, of course. But they could use a little bit of help preserve this as a community space historically and um, community-wide and artsy and every other way it's, it's well used. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Catherine Monson. I'm the pastor of St. John's and I live at Five Little Circle in East Hampton. Thank you. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> So that's it for St. John's, is that right? Okay, thank you, St. John's. That's right. I believe Nico King. Well done. The first concert. <laughs> <laughs> now there will be room for other folks to sit. <laughs> But uh, Garfield Avenue, the Habitat for Humanity Project. Hi, <coughs> excuse me, I'm Jane Andreessen. I live in East Hampton. And, um, so, excuse me, one second. Thank you. Here we go. Door's closed. Okay, I'm sorry to interrupt. Okay. Well, the door's open. There <laughs> <laughs> we go. All right. I'm sorry. All right. So CPA funds are such a wonderful resource to offset some of the less desirable effects of economic growth and progress, like lost open space and um, home buyers being priced out of the market. So as a volunteer with Habitat for Humanity and board member, I'm here to just advocate for their proposed projects, both at Garfield and Glendale. Um, they both support a model of affordable housing. The projects will all be deed restricted, so those homes will stay in the affordable housing pool forever. And um, I think it's something that our towns, particularly Northampton, in this area, um, really need to support. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. So folks for Habitat, if you're speaking for both Garfield Avenue as well as Glendale Road, you can do as was done and speak for both at this point. Thank you. 
Good evening, Jonathan Wright, 91 Olander Drive. Um, first, very briefly, I when I see my tax bill and I see this tiny little increment for community preservation, it's it's just uh, such a, a wonderful moment to write that check and to know how much leverage and how much good is done with that little piece. So thank you. I know it's, it is hard work. I wanted just to, to uh, make a, a plea for housing security. We have people in our community who are renters and um, who have no hope of ownership, whose incomes are such that unless they have subsidy, they're paying close to 50% of their income on inadequate housing. And so the opportunities for ownership that come through the Habitat program are unique, and they are the, they are the final firewall against homelessness and family disintegration. I won't come up again and say the same thing for the Village Hill project from Community Builders, but it really is the same story, that unless we house the people who live here and live with us and in our community, they cannot be well and they cannot thrive. And so um, I've been before you and asked for, for support of, of uh, preservation and uh, outdoor recreation. You've always been responsive, and just tonight I really wanted to focus on the, uh, the critical housing curve in our community where more and more people become less secure in their ability to protect their families and that's a there's no other place to go so these both of these projects from community builders uh, we, we welcome them to our neighborhood they've been terrific neighbors on the hill and uh, the uh, the folks at habitat we've worked with for 25 years are so worthy of your support great thanks <coughs> Brian Saul Baker, um, to Juniper Street. Uh, I'm an architect who is volunteering with Habitat to uh, help with some of the projects. And as an architect, I can definitely say that I daily see uh, the gap between what people are able to achieve for home ownership growing. Um, I'm sure everyone's aware of that. And I think that there should definitely be a path for everyone to own the place that they live. And that's becoming increasingly difficult. And the tools that Habitat Humanity puts in place to make that achievable for people who would never be able to achieve it otherwise are so important, um, particularly on this Glendale Avenue, uh, Glendale, Glendale Road project. Um, they're working with Vermont, and Vermont has had a great deal of success already and has a great track record. And they're putting people in homes that are, are not just homes, but are homes that will be energy efficient, will have good air quality, and will not have exorbitant energy bills, which somebody's already struggling to make a mortgage and then has energy bills on top of that that can also take them out of home ownership. And so uh, they're finding new ways, I think, all the time in order to be able to help people uh, own the places that they live. And if you're talking about community, owning the place that you live is the best insurance you'll have that people will care about their communities, that will invest in their communities, and will really uh, be a part of their communities. Uh, and so I hope you'll support them and help them do and have the work that you do. Great, thank you. Evening, Keith Woodruff from 10 Lexington Ave in State Village. And I'm um, also a board member of Pioneer Valley Habitat. And I'm speaking tonight to support the two projects on Glendale Road and Garfield Avenue. And to um, say how important I feel that it is to have low income housing for families, not only in the downtown area of the community of Northampton, but to be spread out in neighborhoods and um, to be able to um, build the, the zero net en energy modular homes on Glendale Road. Thank you. Thank you. Other folks for the two Habitat for Humanity projects? Todd Weir, 124 Moser Street, Northampton, and I'm wearing my um, housing partnership hat. And if it's appropriate, rather than rising for every one of the housing projects tonight, <laughs> I'd like to make some general comments about all of them kind of together, if that is fine with all of you. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, so at the housing partnership, we're supporting 
um, through a fortunate confluence of events, um, really five projects, four brick and mortar projects, um, that are two habitat projects, the um, Sargent House as well as the Village Hill Project, as well as um, the um, supportive housing counseling program that um, helps people keep their housing once they're in them as well. And um, just for a little, um, just to take a look at uh, historical perspective, over the last 10 years, affordable housing um, has received almost $3 million in uh, community preservation monies, which has done a lot of incredible work in the community. And uh, we took a look back and really every brick and mortar project that's been brought before this body has been approved and supported. And that's just a great track record over the last decade of um, how much you've been able to do with community preservation funds. At the same time, and mainly because of the lack of opportunity of projects to bring to you, affordable housing is the smallest allotment of all the categories, um, of the four categories that you fund. Um, it's received only 17.4% over the last 10 years, um, so it hasn't received a full quarter compared to the other projects. In um, comparison, historic preservation has received a million dollars uh, more than affordable housing, and both open space and recreation have received more than $2 million each more than affordable housing. And again, this is, this is not blame. You've supported every single thing that has been brought to you for 10 years for affordable housing. It really comes down to opportunity and seizing the moment. Um, if there's a farm that's for sale that can be turned into community gardens and recreational areas in Florence, you get one shot at that. You have to do it uh, at the time, and this city did that. And uh, we have gardens in Florence, and I, I love that project. Or, you know, there's moments when you can do Pulaski Park, and, you know, when, when the land's available and the opportunity's there, you have to do it. And in a sense, while this isn't one project, through the confluence of events, this is a great moment to provide a lot of affordable housing in this community. When you put these four projects together, it's over 100 units of affordable housing. And that can make a significant impact in this community. We all know the challenges of um, rising costs of living in this area and the low vacancy rates and really a lot of people just can't afford to live in this community now, and they can't enjoy Pulaski Park or have a community garden if they live too far away. So I think this is, this is a time really to seize the moment. Um, all of these projects are here because we wouldn't have expected all of them a year ago. Who knew that uh, Village Hill, the developer, would have to back out and uh, um, the community, all, both the partners that are working on that, you know, they jumped in very quickly and made this happen. They really turned on the dime and put in a quality uh, proposal that the state was uh, then able to grab. So um, I realize what you're up against. I hear the numbers of uh, what you have. Maybe there's a possibility of extending city bonding to try to create the affordable housing that we need. Um, I know we're heavily bonded, but I think there's still $300,000 that the city could potentially bond um, before you hit your maximum. So I urge you to do everything you can to consider, because um, some of these projects, if we don't support them now, we may not get a second chance to make them happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other folks on the Habitat for Humanity project? Okay, again, uh, folks that are speaking just for those projects, you're welcome to leave, and you're more than welcome to stay as well. Um, Village Hill Apartments? Village Hill, yeah. Hi, my name is Beth Graham Taxby. I live at 74 Village Hill Road in Northampton. I'm here to support the request of the community builders for funding for their project at Village Hill. Um, I moved to Village Hill nearly two years ago and have been thrilled to live in such a thoughtfully planned community, one that preserves the space once occupied by the Northampton State Hospital. 
One of the big selling points for me and my family moving there was the inclusion of housing in the community for folks with a wide range of incomes as well as the care and intent that has gone into retaining green space in the community. Um, there are just a few remaining pieces left for development, which you may be aware of, um, at Village Hill. And so we as a community that live there are always somewhat anxious about what's going to happen, who's going to come. Um, and, you know, it was a, it was a lucky thing for, for us in a way in Village Hill that the other uh, development didn't uh, work out. Um, and we were so delighted to hear that when that happened that, you know, Community Builders was coming in. And I'll tell you a little bit about why the community was uh, thrilled with that. First of all, the Community Builders were the first builders of new residences and remodelers of the uh, remaining buildings at, at Village Hill. And they set a standard at that time for green building and aesthetic design for affordable housing, which was then continued in the construction that followed for market rate residences. Um, what we found out in working with them right now is that they have been receptive to community input every step of the way in their pre-design stages, now in their design stages, and we expect that will continue in their post-design construction stages. Um, they've listened to the concerns and responded with um, making changes to their plans, um, the, the concerns the community had, and they also have been very inclusive about community ideas and wishes into their plans. Um, some of the concerns that the community had was on creating building plans that preserved as much green space, and they have worked with us to do that. Um, they've also organized meetings for the whole community with small groups, individual community members on weekends and evenings. They've attended our monthly um, Village Hill Resident Association meeting and have just responded promptly and thoughtfully to community requests and, cons uh, and overtures. I think they are a development corporation of very high quality um, who depend for their work on funding from sources like the CBC. CBC. Um, it's a testament, I believe, to both the overall design and maintenance and care given to their properties already in place at Village Hill, but many homeowners in the neighborhood are unaware that the apartments that surround them are affordable housing properties. Um, so as a whole, our, our you know, community has applauded their efforts to bring this new development. We welcome them as an already established good neighbor who show great effort in considering the community um, in their plans and show continu their continued interest in being of strong presence. And with your help, um, they will be able to continue to provide affordable housing within a beautiful, welcoming community. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. I'm Arlene, Arlene Bakken, and I live in Village Hill, um, 23 Orlando Drive. And I want to speak to the community builders. I agree with everything you guys said, and you said so well. Um, I worked with the community builders over two decades ago in Amherst to provide um, housing for a mixed income and mixed ability. 25 units of new construction, um, five units set aside for developing disabled adults. And they worked tirelessly for four years to get funding. And we had the funding at one point, and then William Well came in and took away some of it. So we had to be one of the first communities to do tax uh, credits, and that's how we got the thing built. So I want to speak to community builders, really building community, as they say. Uh, it was a wonderful place for my son to live and the other developmentally disabled adults. And I also want to speak as somebody who grew up in a middle-class, working-class neighborhood in New York City. And I see New York City being destroyed by developers. The New York City of the 40s and 50s that I grew up in is gone, and some of those people are coming here and paying cash for houses after selling their, you know, condos in Brooklyn. And I had kind of given up on affordable housing in Village Hill, and so I was absolutely thrilled that there will be 53 units of affordable housing. And I am just personally very gratified to be living in a mixed income uh, community. So I support this project wholeheartedly. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Lanta Dardashwam. I live at 100 Bowser Street, also in Villa Shell. Um, I know everyone is open to the great work that the community builders do, and I'm speaking as a parent of a young child. 
And for those of us that live in Village Hill with young children, there's really a lack of space for kids to run around and play. There is some green space. A lot of it is surrounded by cliffs. Um, so we really have felt the need for a playground and for open space that kids can safely play in. And we started advocating for this about a year ago. And frankly, it felt pretty hopeless because a lot of the land is committed by mass development to be developed. Um, and then, then TCB stepped in and they took over this development and they've really just been wonderful partners. They've listened to the needs of the community. They've generously agreed to basically make a park in the community <coughs> that members of the community and the larger Northampton can use. And so I think that this project definitely deserves your support. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good evening. My name is Dennis Candy, and uh, in a week or so of my address, along with my wife, Fiona Chiang, will be 88 on Santi Drive <coughs> in uh, Village Hill here in Northampton. <coughs> that is, if I don't jump off the cliff first, <laughs> about all the details and various last minute ob obstacles. <coughs> I'm speaking not just on behalf of my wife and I. Um, but on behalf of several of our new neighbours, um, Gary and Grace Drimmer and Ellen and Robert Miracle. Um, we're new to this community and <clears throat> my first impression on arriving in Northampton was um, of a really wonderful, vibrant place. Lots of, lots of things happening, great music, good food, um, and we welcome you, no matter where you're from, signs all over the place. So this is an interesting community. Um, but we've spent, my wife and I, uh, a, a difficult um, year, almost a year now, in uh, negotiating the obstacles of the rental market in Northampton, and then the purchase, the, the market for housing in Northampton. So we went to see one place and we were told, uh, and I said, well, let's think about it. And we were told, well, don't think about it because tomorrow it will be, be sold. And we began to have an understanding, um, not to mention we got sticker shock a few, on, on a few occasions, both in the, in, in the rental market and, and the purchase market. We began to understand a little more um, about what it means to be a really vibrant community. Um, and my work before I came here has been in actually community economic development. Um, and what we know is, and what you know, what we all know, is that mixed income communities work. And, and bubbles of overpriced housing um, uh, are, are, are exclusive. So what I notice is the community has, has an aspiration to be inclusive. Um, I see it in signs, I see it in the things that people care about, I see it in the, in the Gazette, I see it in the, in the ways that people um, uh, make their voices known in one way or another about being, the importance of being an inclusive community. And uh, we can't be an inclusive community if we're pricing significant percentage of the population out of our, out of our housing market. Um, so, I just want to echo those um, statements in favor of your uh, prioritizing your investments in affordable housing. And in particular, say that um, uh, my work is in Pittsburgh, is based there for many years. It's very difficult to be uh, not hearing about the Steelers and so on. Um, and uh, I can, t well, I, I, I just reiterate that uh, the community builders um, are well known in, in, in that city for doing uh, substantive, excellent quality work to deliver um, affordable rental housing. And um, as, a, as an almost resident of Village Hill, um, I want to just um, urge you to, to support that project um, so that Village Hill itself doesn't become in danger of being a bubble, but actually um, models the kind of inclusion that, that the, the town of the whole is aspiring to. Thank you. Thank you so much. <coughs> Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Pat Goggins, Swinebridge Road. 
Uh, I actually am here tonight to speak uh, on behalf of uh, the Valley CDC application. But uh, I've, uh, in the interest of, uh, uh, of uh, the TCB project that is going to be, uh, that is uh, planned for the Village Hill campus, I wanted to just try to uh, provide a little perspective on the, um, the planning of that project, which I've been involved with in one way or another for 25 <laughs> years. Um, it was a project that, it, it is a project that was intended to meet a lot of, uh, so sorry. a lot of the community needs in a way that provided us with yet another village in Northampton, uh, mimicking uh, as best we could the, uh, the wonderful living conditions that exist in the various villages of, of Northampton. The biggest challenge, however, in that, and the source of uh, considerable debate um, throughout the process of, of planning this experiment in new ur urbanism uh, was the idea of being able to integrate affordability into the ho housing, into the plan for housing at the uh, Village Hill uh, project. Uh, all good intentions in place in the beginning to do that. Um, and it did start with the help of TCB uh, back as the original developers of, the, of that uh, uh, entire, entire campus. Uh, they provided us with affordability on the front end with the apartments that have already been described that are integrated in, in a way into the uh, entire campus so that there's no stigma, no <coughs> awareness, no um, uh, idea of making the uh, affordable homes any different or uh, provide any different uh, impression than any of the market homes. But as the project evolved, and as the building code uh, evolved as well in, in our city and throughout the state, the challenge of, of making affordable housing and uh, as part of the, of the uh, village hill plan became uh, very, very difficult to meet. And I, I, I think that it was not, uh, it was not a, a direction uh, that was uh, anything but uh, a good idea of how a village should come together and provide as much uh, across the spectrum of, for, of affordability. But it became more and more difficult to meet the, the real numbers that would work in terms of affordability. So I think the application that you have before you and the ability to assist in what, communi in what Community Builders has planned for the campus will be a, a fitting way to conclude, really, the, the development of, of that uh, entire campus in a way that really, as it turns out, makes the concept that was originally in place work. And it's interesting that TCB would be involved with that because they actually started it. So I see this as something that, that um, is, a, is uh, well worth your, your um, uh, prioritizing in terms of all the wonderful applications that we've already heard about tonight and others that are, that are yet to come. But uh, the way that this, I, I think, will work uh, for the community is that what we're going to really end up having is a real village. A village that has the full range of housing options available to people, pricing that will allow for affordability, assisted, uh, subsidized uh, rental units and market rental units and subsidized housing units and market rental uh, housing units in a way that I think will really bring the whole plan together uh, as, as a community really uh, wanted it to be. Uh, and, and as the plan originally directed, uh, I think that the, uh, it's really fitting that, that, that TCB be the, uh, uh, the, the developer of that, of that last uh, 35 acres uh, in a way that will hopefully um, give plenty of people uh, in our community a chance to live affordably in a very, very nice setting. So thank you very much for the, this opportunity. Thank you.
Other folks for Village Health? <coughs> Uh, moving along and continue with our housing theme, Sergeant House. No one specifically for Sergeant House? Hi. Hello. I'm Danielle McCann. I live at 32 Perkins Avenue. Um, I used to live up by uh, the Sergeant House on Day Avenue and continue to own property up there. And we are very much, me and my family, are very much in favor of this project. It's going to add more than 16 additional SROs to the city, um, meet the needs of a really important segment of the population that we need to be helping to take care of. Um, it's going to be reserving 25% um, of its total units, so including the 15 uh, that they're going to also be enhancing that exist uh, for um, people who are homeless and transitioning into um, you know, a, a place. So um, yes, we're absolutely in favor of it and we think that, um, that, we, need to, that we need to offer this kind of housing um, in our city, much more of it. Traditionally, SROs were a way um, of pr providing a lot of affordable housing and that's no longer the case, but especially with the loss of the motel across the street, which was providing some of that, um, Northampton can and should continue to, to be offering um, many more of these types of units. Uh, Sergeant House, anybody else? Good evening, my name is George Coop. I'm at 234 State Street, downtown. And uh, I'd just like to echo the previous speaker that what we've heard a lot about affordable housing and the mixture of housing that's available in Northampton, the SRO piece is a very important part of that quilt. Um, and I think the project before you of expanding the capacity for that is really, really important. I can also appreciate that it's a, a building that's historically important to the city also and in a location that's close to town that the residents can avail themselves of all the services that are here and also the organization that's behind this is just have a wonderful track record of providing this development and services and uh, an awareness of what the city needs so for that and other reasons I'd like to <coughs> ask the folks here to support that in your priority list this year. Thanks. So much. Sorry. Hello, my name is Jane McColgan. I am the SRO Outreach Coordinator for Center for Human Development. And I provide outreach support and case management services to the tenants at Sergeant House. Um, I spend a lot of time at this property. I'm there on a weekly basis. I'm in the building, I'm out of the building, and um, from what I've seen, the building's been well lived and is in need of some major improvements. Aside from the updates needed to the building itself, I want to acknowledge the affordable housing and um, the expansion would provide many more units to this community and to tenants who are looking to rent S SROs. Lastly, in my experience from working closely with the tenants at 82 Bridge Street, I can speak to the positive impact this renovation and expansion would provide. Given the fact that all tenants would have access to an elevator, along with their own private bathrooms and a kitchenette, their quality of life would improve tremendously. Thank you for considering this. Hi, back again. <laughs> Pat Goggins, 23 Uh The I'm uh, here to speak in, in behalf of the SRO project as well, and uh, thank you for helping fund it previously when we were here, I think in the spring, if I remember correctly. But uh, I wanted to mention, I, I I was interested in particular in, in Todd's uh, discussion uh, and uh, remarks, I should say, um, with respect to the housing partnership which really uh, has played a uh, significant role in, in the community in trying to help sort out what is, what kind of projects we uh, have and how, how uh, they fill the need for affordability in the community. I was, back in 1986, the Northampton formed the housing partnership. I was the first chairperson of, the, of that uh, committee. Claire Higgins was the vice chair. <laughs> and we racked our brains for 10 years 
to get a project that would work and could work and could provide affordability. Um, there was the there was no uh, there is no money available in any form. Uh, your group was not even thought of at that particular point, and it had to be done in a way that was uh, reaching out to uh, individual members of the community. And we finally got a project we could sink our teeth into down on South Street and provided a couple of affordable units, which are, are deed restricted and still in play for affordability. But we're, we're at a point now where we're seeing the fruits of the uh, labor of all of those who have uh, served in the, on the committees that the, the housing partnership committees and all all of the uh, others that have weighed in on this very important uh, um, these very important projects and it's interesting as he was mentioning as I was mentioning the uh, number of projects that you're having to consider so I uh, appreciate the fact that there no doubt are, are many find ways for you to be able to allocate the monies that you have. Uh, I was I had the uh, I was able to attend this afternoon the groundbreaking for the lumber yard on Pleasant Street, which some of you may have read about, uh, where I think there's going to be what, uh, somewhere in the seventy units. Fifty five. Fifty five. Seventy up at the seventy at the live, live one fifty five, right. So that's that's 125 units on Pleasant Street within a block of each other, um, and that's uh, as Jay Ash, the Secretary of Housing and Community Development, did I get that? Yeah. Something like that. Uh, said very <laughs> said very uh, uh, stated very well. Northampton uh, has um, provided the the kind of uh, opportunity to uh, support. Uh, affordable housing in so many ways with the projects that, that have been proposed. He uh, uh, spoke uh, about the fact that we were, we, he, he is always struck by the by the quality of the applications that, that the, I brought before the state to help uh, assemble some of the funds needed to make these projects work. Part of that is what you're going to be doing, trying to figure this out on a project by project basis. I don't envy you because you have a lot of uh, important requests to consider, but uh, the organization Valley CDC is uh, has a mission to provide affordability. Uh, they work very hard to do that. The project on Bridge Street is, uh, I think, well worth your support. I hope you'll give it every consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other folks on Sergeant House. Uh, Perhaps in the interest of continuity, continuing in with the housing stuff, let's uh, move ahead to uh, community housing supportive services. Good evening. I'm Jennifer Derringer, CC North Street. I'm also the managing attorney of Community Legal Aid. We provide civil legal aid for uh, low income folks in the community. And I'm here to support uh, the Northampton Housing Partnership's request for renewal funding. We have we have already gotten three years of funding from the CPC for this project, and it's been incredibly successful. Um, this is the non-bricks and mortar project um, that you are to consider. Um, and what I want to say about that is that the bricks and mortar is obviously incredibly important, and we support all of those projects. Um, but once people get into affordable housing, supporting them in that housing for many people is absolutely critical to their success in affordable housing and their ability to stay in this community. And that's what this project does. Um, so at Community Legal Aid, helping people avoid eviction and stabilizing their housing is, is a priority area for us. And over the past three years, we've worked collaboratively with this project. Um, which has been a tremendous help to our clients who are facing eviction, uh, specifically for non-payment of rent, um, which we know is the primary reason that people are facing eviction in our community. Um, this project, project focuses specifically on this subsection of cases, um, and what it does is it addresses the underlying reasons why folks fall behind in rent and helps put services and supports in place so they are, um, they are stabilized going forward and able to stay in their units. Specifically, the, projects, the project assists tenants in the following ways. 
Uh, it helps folks apply for assistance with back rent from the various agencies in this community that help with that, which is not an easy process to go through, and so support is often needed. They also se secure third-party rental payments. And what this means is that folks are having difficulty paying their rent. There are services out there, Department of Transitional Assistance, an agency called Rent Secure, who can actually take over the payment of those bills so that those folks don't have to worry about that payment and it guarantees on-time rental payments in the future. Also helping with the budgeting, um, the, the project, uh, the person works one-on-one -on -one with folks to help them with their budgets, which you can imagine for low-income folks is an incredibly challenging thing to do. Uh, it makes referrals to other agencies, especially for folks who are experiencing mental health and substance abuse issues, which often comes into play and also works on income maximization, making sure that folks are getting the benefits to which they're entitled. That can make a difference between an unsustainable tenancy because of the, the, the amount of rent and a, one that's sustainable because their income is being increased. What this does also is it allows us, Community Legal Aid, the lawyers, to really focus on the legal aspects of the case while working on the underlying issues that are absolutely critical to settling the case. What they, the work that the project does gives us the tools to help negotiate settlements in these cases and avoid eviction in, um, in the vast majority of cases that we've worked on with them. Um, and if, with your permission, um, two of the tenants are here with us today. I'm looking, there they are. Um, and they are not public speakers like I am, so if I could assist them in their testimony, that would be terrific. Thank, Thank you. you. Gretchen, do you want to come? Or? <laughs> you choose. <laughs> Hi. I'm Gretchen Feist, and I live in Hathaway Farms on Barrett Street. How long have you lived there, Gretchen? I've been there 28 years, and I've been in my present apartment, I think about 13 or 14. I used to live in the next building over. Mm -hmm. And do you have a voucher, a Section 8 voucher, to help yes, you? Yes, I do, room? and it sure does help. I couldn't live in Northampton without it. And a couple of years ago, were you facing um, eviction? Yes, mm -hmm. I was. What were, what were the issues that I you were struggling with? with Recording mm -hmm. and paying my rent. Mm -hmm. And were you also having trouble paying your, your utilities at that yes, time? Yes, I was. Mm -hmm. And you met me in court. Yes. Yep. And I introduced you to the worker Linda from yep. the from the project. And what kind of things did she was she able to help you with? She helped me um, budget and mm -hmm. get services. Mm -hmm. Like if I need to go to appointments, she couple of times she either arranged transportation or provided it for me. Mm -hmm. And did she help you put a service into place to help you pay your rent and your Yes, she did um, Rent Secure, mm -hmm. and they've helped tremendously. And has, have you, were at one point your utilities and heat were, were shut off because yes. of the non-payment, and were you able to get them turned back on? Yes. Mm -hmm. And were you able to pay back the rent that you owed? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're still living in your apartment now? Yes, I am. And, and last time I checked the utility bill, I had a credit. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. That is pretty awesome. <laughs> and your, the eviction case is over. It's been dismissed. Yes. Yeah. God, yeah. That was wicked scary. And you mentioned that um, that Linda helped also with some housekeeping issues, yes, perhaps? Yes, she has. She arranged for someone, oh, um, I'm not sure what organization they're from, it's but like this, Gail? this woman and Gail who comes by once a week who helps me with shopping and um, housework and stuff like that, and she's been wonderful. My cats even like her. <laughs> My very finicky cats. <laughs> and ladies, I mentioned that Linda helped you with budgeting as well? Yes, she has. And how are you doing with that, with your budgeting? Uh, I could use a little work, but it's a heck of a lot better than it was. Uh, do you sometimes have money at the end of the month to pay for yes, things that you might like to have? I'm still getting used to that. <laughs> so has, it, has the project been helpful to you? Oh yes, it's changed my life. Thank you. Is there anything else that you want to say? Um, please keep these services because they've really helped me and I'm sure there are, are plenty of other people in Northampton and surrounding that could really use these, air, these services. So please fund them if you can. <coughs> Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. You're welcome. One more. If I may, Lynn, can you come? Hi, I'm Lynn I live at 38 Holland Street, Northampton. How long have you lived there? A little over two years. And where were you living before that? Grove Street. Uh huh. And that's the, the shelter? The shelter mm -hmm. yeah. And where were you living before that? Exactly. You were homeless before yeah. you went to the shelter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and at some point, did you fall behind in rent? I did. Can you just explain really briefly what that what was going on at that time for you? Um, I suffer from PTSD, depression, and anxiety, um, and I made poor judgments um, in relationship areas. Um, pretty much left the boyfriend control all the money. Um, you know. And were you facing the eviction for yes. the for the non-payment? Yeah. And at some point, you met Linda. Yeah. Uh huh. And did, and she was with you in court that yes. day. Yep. Yes. And I think she was hoping that the case would settle with your landlord, <laughs> yeah. but it didn't, it right? Yeah. And then yeah. Linda introduced you to me, yeah, right? Yeah, needs to have a window in the middle of <laughs> <laughs> Well put. And I should say, I should clarify that Linda was the person on the project. She was hired uh, by CHD to implement the project. Uh, so we keep referring to Linda. Um, and so we had a trial in the case, and the judge put a couple of, um, of, of obligations on you in order for you to be able to stay there. Yes. And was one of them was to get um, to get rent secure. Rent secure. Uh -huh. yeah. And was Linda able to help you yes. with that? Uh, we did the application and all that, and got it you know, all in place so that I could have them for the last two months. Great. So that's in place, and, uh -huh. and things are, are stabilized yep. now. Great. Um, and is there anything else that you want to tell the committee? I don't know. Without these guys, I would be standing in line for the cash shelter right now. Um, <coughs> I didn't know these agencies were available, you know, to people like me, you know, going into court, um, the first time for housing court, you know, you're not knowing what to expect and being told, you know, no, we're not going to make arrangements of you and when would you like to move out? Um, it's pretty stressful, but with these guys, you know, I'm still in my place. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank Thanks you so much. Thank you. <coughs> Hi, I'm Linda. Just <laughs> <laughs> I'm Melinda. Um, and I live in Florence at 497 Riverside Drive. I am the community housing support person that was hired for this project. Um, I began in July 2015, and since then, I worked and opened 52 cases, 52 households served, 43 of them were court involved, um, nine were before the court action. Sometimes I would get referrals from, oh, you should call Linda, they'd tell their neighbor, call Linda, she'll help you, before there's even, there may be a notice to quit, but no court involvement. Um, out of the 52 households that I helped, there were four evictions in, since July 2015. Um, two were extremely mentally ill individuals who could not engage with services and one was too paranoid to even do an intake with me. One household wanted to be evicted so that they could go to the shelter with their children and get home-based subsidy, even though we tried to talk them out of that. And then one continued not to pay their share of rent um, and had a substance abuse issue and ultimately was, um, they had an agreement with Northampton Housing Authority to pay their rent and something. Um, he didn't do that and he was ultimately evicted. He, he defaulted actually on his court case. Um, five cases were referred to Rent Secure for voluntary rent payee and that has made the difference in people being evicted or not. Um, some people just would get that check on the first and they'd have 18 bills to pay and they had friends to pay back because they borrowed money and didn't know how to get out of the hole. Rent Secure gets the entire check, um, pays the rent, pays one other bill, and then they get the remainder on a card. All that same day, on the first. So by 9.30, they've got their money. And this is opposed to having to wait a week for the remainder of their check to be sent. Um, so there was one case, um, that was not court involved. The person was not doing what I was suggesting. And it was a Northampton Housing Authority case and I worked very closely with Northampton Housing Authority's attorney um, to say, you know, the plan's not working. You need a little bit extra leverage, bring this to court. That was the only case that I asked the attorney actually to bring it to court. There was no court leverage for me to say, if you don't do this, they're gonna evict you. They kept making payment plans. Um, I don't know if there's any questions, but you've heard from two of the women that um, were incredibly strong and incredibly brave to come here, and I'm so honored that they agreed to do that. And with that, thank done. you so much. Thanks. Good evening, everyone.
Um, my name is Luis Martinez. I'm the program manager for Diversion Shelter and Housing for the Center for Human Development. Uh, we oversee the Community Housing Support Services Program at the SRO here in the city of Northampton. I'm um, here tonight to show support and show CHD's uh, investment to continue this program uh, within the city. Um, as you can see by Linda's testimony and it's two ladies that are here as well. Uh, we're here to meet people where they're at, focus on their strengths and build them up. Uh, we also work hard so we can communicate with them, listen to what their needs are, help them to build the skills for their future success. Uh, we do this by helping people be stabilized, save their tenancy, assist them with their arrears, and at the end of the day, we just want people to become self-sufficient. Um, at CHD, we believe that all people deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. And sometimes uh, we find that the people that we come to serve are the less fortunate people that have a lot of barriers and issues. And when they come to us and we find them, we're able to find the avenues and the ways to help them be successful. So at the end of the day, we just hope that we can continue to uh, have this partnership and be able to uh, serve the people here city of Northampton. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Other folks for community housing support services? I think that's it. That's it. We'll take a quick moment for those folks to find their way out. We certainly have an articulate bunch of Northampton residents, don't we? <laughs> Pleasure to listen to, to people support their or our project. Uh, moving right along, Academy of Music. Me? My name's Tom Douglas. I'm the, I'm the I live at on Crescent Street in Northampton, and I have an architecture office on Pleasant Street. And I've been volunteering for the Academy of Music for many years, going back to when uh, they needed a new marquee. Um, I did pay for some of the work that I've done, but I've put in hundreds of hours of volunteer work as well for the Academy. So I'm here just to. Um, begin the conversation of the preservation project that we're trying to start at the Academy. And um, just start, sort of walk you through the process that I go through uh, in a preservation project like this. So, uh, so it doesn't seem like we just kind of make spur of the moment decisions about what we do, that we have a real method to um, what the steps that we take um, to, to create the project that we do. Um, the first step that we go through is uh, look back at old records to see if we can find anything in the newspapers that describe the uh, building that we're working on. So I gave you um, a copy of, uh, I think it was a Republican and Gazette article from 1891. And I'll just read a tiny bit from it. Um, I'll be really quick, but um, it says, uh, this, I'll read the portions. The accompanying cut gives a fair idea of the exterior of the new Academy of Music, which is just being finished at Northampton and which is without a doubt one of the best equipped theaters in the country. It's been constructed at a cost of about $100,000 by Mr. Lyman, a native of Northampton who has his summer residence in Northampton and his business headquarters in New York. Buildings have been formally uh, opened on the 25th with a musical festival. The generosity of Mr. Lyman is in erecting such a substantial structure is much appreciated and it's been erected for the use of the people in Northampton and in and is, in effect, a gift to the city. And so the articles go on with a lot of description about the uh, theater, but the reason we look at these things is because there is some real information that we can glean from them, and I'll just read you a little piece of it. Um, this is just about the foyer of the academy, and that's part of the project that we're asking to get funding for. Um, the foyer is 15 by 30 feet long. It has a vaulted ceiling. On the right and the left broad, are broad flights of um, stairs that lead right up to the balcony, and on the south, three doorways open to the auditorium. 
They're hung with rich curtains, and the floor is hard polished, polished wood and covered with rugs. The walls above, uh, the walls above a lofty wainscot, or elabor are elaborately decorated in Antwerp blue and white. And the cornice of ornate design and car is carried entirely around the spring and the ceiling. So here, this is an example of how we can glean information from a historic document to try to um, come up with a color scheme that we're trying to repaint the theater with. So after we go through documents like this and we have a general idea of what we're looking for, then we go in with um, and start to remove paint in certain areas. And this is what we did in the auditorium as well. And there's a picture in the um, document that I gave you of a blotch of wall with this blotchy kind of old paint on it. So we, we take a very mild um, paint remover and we take off the three or four layers of paint that were there. The Academy's been at major repaintings, I think, three times. And then we get down to what we can find, which is original but it's a very different color than what was ori originally there, but there's enough there that we can tell what the general idea was. So um, after that, we'll put together a color scheme based on what we found, and we'll paint a full-scale mock-up, and the mock-up is reviewed by the board, and also we, we send pictures to um, Mass Historic Commission because they are the ultimate decider of uh, what we do there, because there's a deed restriction on the property controls everything that we do. So, and then there are other uh, pieces of uh, documentation within the theater that we can uh, try to match. One of them is light fixtures, I think, in your walkthrough, you looked at some different old light fixtures that we um, had found in the theater. And uh, even though we can't have them custom made, we can look for off-the-shelf items that um, are pretty close match. A custom made fixture would be like a fortune compared to what we can get off the shelf. So, and then at that point, after we've gotten the approvals and gone through this historic documentation process, we um, were able to start the real work of putting together the architectural drawings and put it out to bed. Um, and that's the part that I get paid for, but up to that point, it's volunteer. So, I just wanted to ask you uh, to help us in our funding effort to um, preserve these parts of the academy that we haven't been able to tackle yet. Uh, we'd like we have a couple of big reasons we'd like to do it. One is that we create kind of a seamless building that has our unfinished areas become compatible what we've, with what we've already done in the theater. Because right now there's a real jarring um, difference between the two spaces. We'd also like to bring the building, the whole building, back to the jewel that it originally was that Mr. Lyman gave to the city. And one of the things that we feel like creates the vibrancy of Northampton and um, helps to um, get people to want to move here and live in the affordable housing. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you so much. Good evening. My name is Dave Pomerantz. I'm the Director of Central Services for the City of Northampton. And the Academy is one of the buildings that my department maintains and oversees on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so I get to work very closely with Deborah and her staff um, in improving and maintaining um, this cultural gem that we have sitting right across from my windows from Pulaski Park. Um, I'm here tonight, I'm going to keep it very brief because of your agenda, but to totally support uh, the Academy's request for CPA funding. I know Deborah has done a presentation before you already and I just want to note that uh, while my department is heavily involved in both maintenance and capital improvement work on an ongoing basis at the Academy, so everything from roofs to fire escapes to structural support in the building, um, Deborah's focus is really on sort of the aesthetics, which certainly intertwines what we do in central services on a day to day basis. So uh, I want to continue working with that concept and again, uh, would wholly endorse and support uh, the committee's vote to fund the improvements that uh, will help to continue the uh, rich and full life of the Academy of Music. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I'm Bob Reckon of the 36 Fruit Street, um, and I'm a former director of the Academy. And you will need the wisdom of Solomon to come up with the right answer tonight. There is no single right answer. You like hear all these 
<coughs> touching tales of why <coughs> worthy groups need money. I used to be a building contractor. And so I know that people come and you say, oh, I want to redo this and do this and do this and do this. And you tell them it's going to cost them too much money. They say, okay, we'll just do this and this for now. And then they get move on to something else in a couple of years and something else be after that. And it's all necessary work. So it's been great. The, the, the Canyon Music has raised a lot of money in the last 10 years. We've got $2 million from the state to redo the whole the, the, the stage and the roof and raised a lot, a lot of money from other sources as well. The CPA has been a good source of money for the interior renovations and the auditorium and things like that. So I think it's like you've got to keep up your house. You, you know, if you don't do the roof, or paint the walls, you're going to be in trouble. So I know it's not affordable housing and it's not open space, but if this is a case where you, the city has now invested tremendous amount of we, we got a free gift from Lyman 125 years ago, and we've done a great job at bringing it almost all the way back. So this is, I don't want to make it sound trivial, but it's, this, is a, this is a real bricks and mortar project which will polish up the gym that is the Academy of Music. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I'll um, sort of piggyback on, on what on Deborah J. Anthony, and I live at 141 Round Hill Road in Northampton, Massachusetts. So I'm the executive director of the Academy of Music. And um, I'll piggyback on to uh, some of the remarks made by both um, Tom Douglas and, and uh, Bob Reckman. And that I can underscore the the um, importance of the academy not not just for us and I know that this the city the CPA has demonstrated um, their support for the for the academy and its value to the city but even on the national level the academy of music is one of the oldest and longest running theaters in the nation I think it's the sixth oldest um, theater in this nation. There are not many theaters that are left like the Academy of Music, and it's here in our city. And I feel it's so important that we preserve its history, its story, and we've come so far um, in preserving the, um, in the envelope of the building, and now um, we're very close to finishing the interior of the building. So I also want to um, uh, um, encourage you to support this project because it also allows us to leverage these funds to get a match from the state bond bill, um, and uh, which would go a long way. Uh, and we would be able to do uh, some maintenance um, a maintenance project that's uh, costly enough to put it in the sprinkler system in the auditorium. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Good evening, I'm Andrew Crystal. Um, I live at Village Hill and I just want to reinforce what the prior speaker said. I live there because it's a mixed income, mixed ownership community and I encourage you to support that project as well. I'm also the president of the board of the Academy of Music and speaking on their behalf this evening. And while Tom spoke eloquently to the aesthetics and historic preservation research we've done, I know Deborah's explained the overall project and what the, the Academy means to the community. The fiduciary responsibility sits with the board. And um, the CPA has been generous with the Academy in the past, granting us money to do prior historic renovation work. Um, we've been rewarded in 2015, we were granted a Massachusetts State Historic Preservation Award for the work we did in part with the funding from the committee. I just want to reinforce that we have very limited source of capital. Um, the board doesn't own the building, we can't go borrow against it, we can't mortgage the building. We can raise money through capital campaigns, which we did several years ago. It was the first ever that the Academy done. We had set a very modest goal of $100,000. The community rose and, and donated $165,000. That helped us get through the auditorium renovation. As Deborah referenced, there's some state fundings, the rules have changed, and we now have to generate matching funds to get those state grants. So it makes 
the money that the community is supporting us even that much more important. And I would hope that you would consider our request favorable. I think this is like a love fest tonight with different groups supporting other groups. So I just wanted to say Joey Campbell, uh, 13 Perkins Avenue, also the Executive Director of Valley Community Development, working on a couple of housing projects. And I want to say for the, for the Academy that um, Pioneer Valley Ballet has, I've been here almost 20 years, I think, for 20 years they call me up every year and say, we have 10 tickets for the Nutcracker, you know, and we distribute them to our tenants. We put a little word out, first come, first serve, when they have other events. So, you know, there's this synergy that goes on um, that is really unseen because they just go out and contact different corporations to see who can use uh, free tickets. So I don't know, there may be other groups that do that as well, but it's a way for folks who live in town, they don't need a car, they can walk to the academy, um, and so I, I think the Academy is a great asset and they do a lot of free shows as well. Great access. Uh, I can't think of them, it's too late in the night. Um, <laughs> asset to the community, thanks. Thank you so much. Okay, we have a question. All right, again, thanks for your patience. Rose, okay, you are. Waiting. Uh, let's move on to the two open space uh, acquisition projects. Uh, we'll just combine those uh, Mineral Hills and Rocky Hill. Hi, my name is Kate Futolf. I live in Greenfield, actually, but I work for Mass Audubon at Arcadia in Northampton slash East Hampton. And I'm here to support open space preservation and these two projects, um, specifically the one that's that we're working on with the city of Northampton. It's this sort of once in a lifetime opportunity. We have willing sellers, which we haven't had for many years. And these are key pieces in a wildlife corridor that we're trying to connect Arcadia to the Rocky Hill Greenway. Um, wildlife corridors are just as essential as affordable housing for animals who need to roam across the wild the landscape and protecting land is also one of the key strategies for dealing with climate change and adapting to things such as the massive rain we just experienced this week. So I would urge you to support both the projects that have come forward for open space preservation as well as keeping some money in the open space fund for projects that come along and need a little funding. Keep going. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello, I'm Ann Lombard, 11 Allen Place, and I'm speaking also for the corridor. I think now is the time for the Route 10 part of the wildlife corridor. I'm on the sanctuary board at Arcadia. And uh, those owners are now willing to sell, finally, after many years of trying to get them. And it's an opportunity. And once that space is gone and it's developed, uh, it's too late. So we need something that needs to be done now. And uh, it really, in addition to the wildlife corridor going from Mount Tom right through to the Mineral Hills that we would like to have, uh, it's it's so important for mitigation for the climate, because the more land we save, the less is developed, and it all will relate to the improving the climate change, trying to minimize the climate change that is coming upon us. So I really support any, any money you can provide to get this accord uh, done while we can. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I'm Bob Zimmerman. I live on North Front Road. I'm also the president of the Broadbrook Coalition, which manages the Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area for the city. Besides our own conservation area, we are concerned with other conservation areas in, the, uh, in Northampton, as well as our own. And first, to speak to the Rocky Hill Project, um, as has been pointed out, 
the acquisition of the land as proposed would provide greater mobility for wildlife uh, crossing from the west to, to the east and the east to the west. Animals need these wildlife corridors for breeding, for foraging, even for taking shelter in extreme weather. You might say that, well, Route 10 runs right down between the two portions of the conservation lands that we're talking about between Arcadia and Rocky Hill. That's true, that's an inhibition to movement of animals, but having greater frontage on each side of the road <coughs> that animals can use will make it ultimately safer for them. One day, we might hope that we can build tunnels or bridges for wildlife to cross our roads. It's a project actually in the Department of Transportation of Massachusetts. I realize that's not an issue here, but in considering wildlife corridors, one has to think about the barriers to circulation, but also how to make it better under the circumstances where there, <coughs> there are animals who want to cross uh, between the areas that have been set aside for their use. The other purchase involves <coughs> a portion of land uh, close to and between two portions of the Mineral Hills Conservation Area. That represents a different kind of opportunity. There is an old lead mine, one of many which were built in Northampton from the 1600s on, and I think it may be the only one that's still extant in Northampton. It's a wonderful opportunity to preserve uh, a kind of uh, a memorial to a kind of activity, which is what's quite prevalent in that area, in that part of the city. It's a wonderful teaching tool. It's a very interesting um, kind of uh, uh, development from the past that I think we should really consider preserving uh, for the future and using as a teaching tool and exhibit of the kinds of activities that took place in Northampton historically. I also want to make some conservation, uh, comments about the conservation fund. Uh, should I do that now or Please. should I wait? Yeah. Pardon? I guess fine, Bob. Yeah. The <coughs> Conservation Commission has an application in for funding of what's called the Conservation Fund. The Conservation Fund is an invaluable, almost indispensable tool for protecting agricultural and conservation land in Northampton. There are really two functions that it serves. One is to provide soft costs for <coughs> um, involved in the acquisition of land by the city. That entails surveys, appraisals, title searches, um, baseline studies which are uh, essential for one of the more important uses of so soft costs, which is for conservation restrictions, <coughs> which are now required on, I think, all of the land that's acquired by the city. It used to be that conservation restrictions could be, would be held by various conservation organizations quite freely without any charge. That era is over. Conservation organizations are very unwilling to take on conservation restrictions uh, without being funded. There are numerous costs now involved in maintaining and monitoring conservation restrictions. The other purpose that the Conservation Fund serves is as a rapid uh, source of rapid action money uh, to act on largely small purchases of land within the city uh, that otherwise would not be possible without immediately available cash. Um, land acquisition in general takes a great deal of work, a great deal of um, consideration by uh, city council and other um, uh, organizations within the city. So the uh, Conservation Fund makes a small amount of money available for rapid action for extremely high priority purchases. So um, I would like to support both 
the purchases of land for conservation purposes and the continued funding of conservation fund, which I think is really most important uh, for the preservation of open space in North Acton. And thanks for the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mark Longsley, 1086 Burt's Pit Road in Florence. I'm also the Land Conservation Manager for Kestrel Land Trust. Uh, I'm here today to support both of the land conservation projects as well as the conservation fund. I think Bob spoke wonderfully about all of them. Uh, I'll speak about two. Uh, just to follow up with this point on the conservation fund, um, this is not something that Northampton uh, has come up with that's unique. Uh, conservation organizations know that this type of funding is needed. Kestrel has a small discretionary fund that we are able to use in a rapid fashion and not go through our board for a vote just because we know we sometimes need to take a quick decision to get an appraisal to help pay for a survey and we actually usually match our funds with communities so we're able to work with Northampton and say hey we'll pay for half if you pay for half and really move the project forward together so it's really just a critical functional thing for communities to have if they have the ability to provide them. Um, I want to speak out just a little bit more on the mining heritage edition. Um, sometimes we call it the Galena project. Uh, but interesting, I want to talk a little bit less about mining and more about access. Uh, for me, the Mineral Hills and their importance really kind of struck me at first when I listened to a presentation by Lori Sanders a few years ago on the history of conservation in Northampton. And in that preservation, I think that one thing, my, one of my most important takeaways was she talked about several places on Route 66 where you could head north and walk through the forest for nine miles and only cross one road. And that just astounded me. You know, I grew up in New Jersey. I'm now living in Northampton, and this is a developed area. Uh, and certainly the Mineral Hills is part of that vast swath of forest land that she was talking about, um, as well as being one of the largest conservation areas in the city. I have since learned that the connections are even bigger than that. Uh, that whole corridor has actually been identified by the Nature Conservancy as part of a much larger wildlife corridor, uh, locally called the Berkshire Linkages by TNC, but ultimately it serves to connect uh, the Northern Appalachians all the way through the Canadian Maritimes as a wildlife corridor. So talk about uh, thinking globally and acting locally. This is a great opportunity to do that. Um, certainly in the Mineral Hills, the city has recognized their importance and has invested in their protection for decades. Uh, Kestrel Land Trust has devoted our own time and efforts, uh, both staff time as well as mobilizing our volunteers to monitor the multiple conservation restrictions that we actually hold in the Mineral Hills, uh, thereby ensuring that the city's investment does indeed continue in perpetuity as it should. Uh, so the trick of it is, if you want to walk all those miles that Laurie Sanders was talking about, you need access to their full extent. So it's really quite remarkable that a piece of land has come available with frontage on Route 66 that can provide public access and public parking to the southernmost tip of the Mineral Hills uh, to really make that step, make that trip not just imaginary or not just available for a naturalist who's willing to go traipsing through people's backyards and actually make a legal public access. Um, we're heartened that the city is already trying to leverage state funds through the land grant program. Uh, and just when you add in the fact that the historical nature of the property, uh, which Bob spoke about, uh, it is, as far as I understand, the only extent lead mine from the old Loudville lead mine areas that's in Northampton. They have really a wonderful history. Ethan Allen actually owned several of the lead mines back then and provided uh, munitions for the Civil War uh, from that area, something that not many people know about. So really remarkable to be able to preserve. Um, and as a previous speaker said, with these land conservation projects, you just never know if and when the opportunity to protect a piece of land like this and provide access is going to come up again. So I hope the city will continue its investment in the Mineral Hills and complete its protection and its plans for public access. And a Kestrel Land Trust certainly looks forward to continuing our partnership with the city into the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, Janet, Bissell, out of the 36 Maynard Road here in Northampton, 
And I just want to say, along with all my friends back here, I go along with these three proposals and requests for funds from you. I particularly also want to say that we've talked a lot about wildlife corridors, but I think it's also important to realize that these are forests and they will help cut down on the fragmentation of our landscape. And, um, you know, enlightened self-interest is going to be very important in the future. These forests are very crucial for the resiliency that uh, these animals will need, the biodiversity, and that we will need for climate change. Uh, these forests are going to be crucial then. That's what most of the, this land is. So Northampton's been very good, and I appreciate the funding you've uh, given us in the past for a lot of the acquisition that we've done. And I uh, hope you will continue it in the future. I don't envy you your task. And, uh, thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Fred Andreessen. I'm from East Hampton. And I'm here to add the East Hampton um, point of view on behalf of the Pascomic Conservation Trust. We're an all-volunteer land trust in East Hampton. And we've worked a lot with um, with Ar Ar Arcadia and Kestrel and City of East Hampton to protect these lands, particularly uh, focusing on areas around Arcadia and, um, um, and the Manhan River and Hannah Brook, which is why we're particularly interested in these parcels, both to continue the, the wildlife corridor from Connecticut River and, and Manhan uh, and uh, Arcadia and Mount Tom up to the west, as everyone has described, but also um, around the Manhan and Hannah Brook, we have PCT, our trust, um, has protects properties there and the further migration from those wildlife um, uh, up through uh, the Mineral Hills area is also key and on to the, uh, the other undeveloped hill town lands to their west. So um, those two purchase projects are, are important to us and also the, the land grant thing, I mean the land preservation fund also, we, we know it's so important to have that the funds on hand from our 30 years experience with, with that. Um, and just emphasize taking into account the timeliness of opportunities because they, you know, these things come up and they can disappear uh, if we don't take advantage of them. So that's, I guess, one of the biggest pitches for, uh, for funding our things <laughs> within your very challenging uh, balancing act. So thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Dave Richards. I live at a 22 Warburton Way. I'd like to uh, speak in favor of the, uh, the three open space projects and uh, hope you consider them uh, your grants. Uh, my previous speakers uh, spoke very uh, very uh, strongly in favor of these, and I'm trying not to repeat their, their comments. I just want to emphasize that I think that uh, the Office of Planning and Sustainability has done a remarkable job since the inception of the CPA in preserving land in Northampton. And uh, I would like to see it continue and as one who has carried a petition back in 2005 for the first uh, Community Preservation Act, which fortunately passed. And again, uh, several years ago, I carried a petition uh, when it was uh, the Community Preservation Act uh, was put up for repeal, and I think that was the one on the long side said, vote no. Uh, but I, I, I just want to emphasize that, uh, to me, the, the, the Mineral Hills uh, conservation area is, is, is really a, a true treasure in the city, and I would love to see its, its, uh, the efforts continue to, as uh, Mark Walmsley just pointed out, uh, to, to basically allow someone to walk from East Hampton to Williamsburg, and a good chunk of that has already been preserved. And with uh, your approval, of this funding uh, for the for the project, it will it will just be another another piece of the land that that has been put into preservation, and hopefully that will be continued. So thank you very much. Thank you. See two minutes to the <laughs> clock. So we'll be very no, no, no. We're we're, we're good to go. Uh, actually, um, I'm Garrett Stover. I live on Fairview Avenue. Before that, I lived on Olive Street. And uh, so not only have I lived in that neighborhood, but I've done conservation work with Wisconsin and uh, worked with Arcadia in the past. 
uh, in land protection. But uh, since all of the eloquent arguments have been made on that behalf, I just want to say that I also drive to East Hampton frequently um, down Route 10. And every time I've driven by that frontage, I grip the steering wheel a little bit tighter and think, oh, is that pickup truck a uh, surveyor? Is that one uh, you know, a housing developer? Uh, not affordable housing developer. <laughs> <laughs> so every time I go by there and I see that the woods are still there and that there's still a, uh, I don't want to call it a barrier between Northampton and East Hampton, but a, a wonderful respite between what has become um, almost an unbroken corridor of development. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a really psychologically important thing um, for both communities, I think, to, to not feel that we're just part of a uh, Route 9 um, sprawl. Um, and I, I, I'll add one quick historic note. Uh, I worked for a long time with Mass Land Trust Coalition on the state level and uh, was part of the discussions about the Community Preservation Act and uh, strategies, political and uh, otherwise. And I just want to say to all of you, it's, it's um, thrilling to see you doing the work that was envisioned and the, the coalition that came together to support it of sort of preservation, affordable housing, and conser uh, land conservation. Um, all of those people would be so grateful to you for carrying on that vision. Thank you. <coughs> Other folks on the uh, two open space acquisitions or the conservation fund? I just have brought um, a little letter of support from PCT. Do you have a clerk for that? Uh, right over here, sir. Okay. That's the picture I didn't forget. Thank you. Thanks. Anybody else on the open space? Okay, last but certainly not least, the rail trail expansion project. <laughs> <laughs> My name is John Galston. I live at 20 Ward Avenue, Northampton, and I'm an officer of the Friends of Northampton Trails and Greenways. Uh, you've heard a lot of requests for big projects and lots of money. I'd like to mention just a couple of facts of how small amounts can have a huge effect. Uh, you know about the trail system we have now. <clears throat> you know also that uh, it is not complete. Uh, there are areas of Northampton that are not served really very well at all, namely in the uh, western part of the city. Uh, we've used up all of our real rail trails uh, with one small exception, namely the section from Leeds to the Northampton-Williamsburg line is not complete. And there is a proposal before you, as I understand, for help in completing that. Uh, the other uh, project that's in, uh, been applied for has to do with a access point uh, to the trails, a new access point uh, near uh, the <coughs> uh, maintenance area of <coughs> Look Park. Uh, my comment <coughs> I want, would like to make is in terms of small amounts having big leverage. Uh, most of the work that has been done, or much of the work in any case, in expanding the rail trails has been for uh, supported by grants from state, federal sources. To write a grant application, you need information that is convincing for that agency to give you money. How do you get that? The engineering study that gets you started, where do you get money from that? It's a small amount of money, can't come from taxes, can't come from another grant that you, uh, you're trying to just get it started. But small amounts of money, uh, such as our organization helps the city with, uh, can get a project started. 
So I call that the first dollar effect uh, in generating uh, expansion of the trail system. The second effect is what I call the last yard effect. Uh, one gets a grant, such as for a trail section, and it's very hard for to plan down to the exact dime or penny or dollar the a cost of that project. But if you have a small uh, support of free money, so to speak, to help in a project, then you can take the grant money and plan to spend the entire amount uh, with the <coughs> assurance that if the estimate of a particular section of the trail, the construction of that, is a little bit off, you have a little bit of extra money to <coughs> uh, fill in and finish that planned project. Whereas otherwise you would have to say, well, you know, we might be 1% over or something like that. We better hold back a little bit on finishing something. So I call that the last yard effect. You don't want to end up with the trail extending leaves towards Williamsburg having one empty uh, spot along it. And with that, I urge you to think about small grants as well as these larger ones that you've heard about in the early part of this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, George Kohout, 234 State Street, again. Um, so I'm the president of our Friends of the Northampton Trails and Greenways with John Gausset and one of the officers. Um, first, I want to echo my friend Garrett and thank you very much for doing what you're doing. I've sat in your chair. This is a very long night. I appreciate that all of you have really paid attention um, over two hours. It's been great. Um, I know I've learned a lot in the past two hours, too, about some of the other things that make Northampton a community that it is. Uh, what, what I heard, too, is this kind of regional thing that Northampton is our, our regional hub here um, when it comes to the housing services, when it comes to the conservation land. Um, the, uh, other communities look to us to really um, be that not only the pioneers but the stalwarts in doing a lot of these regional things locally and also regionally. The, the rail trail that the Office of Planning and Sustainability is asking to complete is really in many ways um, a, would be a symbolic almost thing for our neighbors in Williamsburg to have that um, authentication that the rail trail does work because that city as you know is on kind of still the cusp of uh, getting the money and getting the political willpower to kind of continue the rail trail forward. Um, the other night I went to the Friends of the Manhand Rail Trail in East Hampton. They're meeting. They're doing a wonderful job in East Hampton. The state's doing a great job with the rail tunnel now underneath the railroad tracks and across into Hadley. This last piece up to Williamsburg will really demonstrate to the state that we're still committed to rail trails and their development um, as we continue, as the state helps the other communities to continue doing this. So for, for that reason too, and as my John mentioned, it's a very small piece, but I think it's an important piece for the state to see that the, the city has other funds that are going to help to leverage this. Our main purpose at the Friends of the North End of Trails and Greenways is to fundraise money in order to help, help the Office of Planning and Sustainability to go after these grants. And we're able to do that to a certain extent. We have 200 members who are pretty active, um, and they also support this next step towards the Williamsburg Trail on um, the Williamsburg timeline. Um, you know, it, it was so hard to listen to all these other stories and know that we have one pie and you're going to have to steal from Peter to pay Paul. Um, it's hard to, I think the Reverend um, did a great job about explaining about the, not the inequality, but the imbalance perhaps of the spending on recreation and historic preservation rather than uh, housing. So I don't want to take away anything from our housing efforts in this city. Um, but this little piece of the rail trail is very small, and I think it would go a long way in giving uh, Northampton that continued oomph in this direction. So, again, I appreciate your time doing this, and I hope I urge you to support that project out of the Office of Planning and Sustainability. Thanks. So Are there any other friends here? <laughs> Devin! <laughs> Devin Bruce from uh, 46 Columbus Avenue. 
Avenue. I'm on the city's pedestrian bicycle safety committee, so I'm speaking from that seat. Um, what's been said about the rail trail is, is, is something I agree with all of, all of the comments about what value we have in it and what little bit more would give it really an entry point nor uh, to the hill towns that would, you know, people would bike into town for work. I mean, that's really what I'm hoping for. Um, the, uh, the state has just put out a new bicycle peg plan that we try to fit in underneath. Um, it's, it's an exciting time to be working on pedestrian safety, which is a piece I care deeply about. Um, I'll close and let this go, but I, uh, I get an adventure cycling uh, uh, bike bits newsletter every day, and this is one sentence out of what was on my very today's list. I was not yet 16 when I understood a great deal from having ridden bicycles for so long about style, speed, grace, purpose, value, form, integrity, health, humor, music, breathing, and finally, and perhaps best, the relationship between the beginning and the end. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, that was, at least for me, speaking for myself, two hours of the most articulate and passionate um, mini speeches that I think I've really ever heard. So for all of you that have waded through it with all of us, thank you so much. Um, you're welcome to leave now. I, I will also speak for myself that if we start deliberating this tonight, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> So while you all leave, we will we'll wrap things up here. And again, our deliberations begin two weeks from tonight on the 15th. Or of course, this is a close. Yep. Still. 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 So we are still meeting folks. If you want to make your conversation. No. Yeah, we'll let uh, you know. So, uh, am I correct in assuming that we're pretty much there for this evening? Okay. Yeah. Um, I would like to make a personal plea that um, I'm not sure we're going to wrap this up in two weeks. And I was just wondering, we have a, a meeting schedule also for the 29th, I believe. And I'm wondering if it's possible to postpone that to the first Wednesday of December rather than that last Wednesday of November. Maybe folks could think about it. Uh, it was, so we're, we're good to go for the 15th, which is two weeks. We have a sort of question mark around the 29th. And I'm wondering if we could put that off to the, I want to say the 6th. Is that Thanksgiving Eve? No. No, it's a week after. It's a week after. Yeah. Anyway, I think we need to decide that now, but maybe if, if Sarah, you can send out a memo asking about that. Yeah, so that might, that will put the recommendations to the, uh, after January for the city council, but that's probably fine. I don't have one. Okay. Heard any of the applicants too terribly. So maybe you could send us an email okay. about that. Uh, any other business not foreseen when the agenda was done? Yeah. One quick question for me. I will put together a very detailed financial report and mail down exactly what we can do for this bonding. Is there anything else that would be helpful to anybody? In previous um, rounds, you put together like an nice spreadsheet just saying what yeah. all the asks were. Yep. That'll just be a tab on there. Yep. So, and then uh, we have so much in each yes. pile, and which ones can some of them can come from yeah. can go to ch from two piles. That's, in the, that's in the yeah. Excel sheet. That you yeah, can, right? I'll, I'll I'll distill it a little okay. bit more so it's easy yeah. to figure out. And I think folks are aware. Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe we talked about this two weeks ago. The hundred thousand that we had allocated for um, the courthouse now is going into the courthouse right. given the collapse because the roof fell down. So the, roof. The, the following day. Yeah. Yes, right. So, um, so we, so that hundred thousand that we had come in, it's not that we're we're taking out of this nine hundred thousand. It was never in it to begin with. It was never in it to begin with. It's not, not and it's not coming back. It's not available. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, two things that 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 sort of weighing on my mind as we go into the decision making process, and I would like to 
have other people thinking about it as we go into it. One is, are we, are we willing to spend down all the money this round? Mm -hmm. And the other is um, the point that, that Todd raised, um, would we be willing to consider additional bonding? And so you'll come back yeah, with our, us on what that bonding will be. Our capacity is very low at the moment. Uh -huh. I it might even, it's about a quarter million. Okay. It costs or, or so. And I'll I'll bring details. Can you okay. explain that what that actually means? So that um, we have to retain enough money if the CPA were repealed tomorrow to mm -hmm. still be able to meet our previous financial obligations. I see. So that's the most of money that we could borrow. Most most amount of money that we could borrow this round. And we, we are still paying off these bonds for Pulaski Park for both the extension as well as the, the main thing for um, for yeah, the Florence Field. Uh, so we so we really we had bonded for the, the for Forbes the Forbes Library as well, but that's been paid off. So. But I raise these because they're sort of philosophical mm -hmm. discussions. Yeah. Maybe then, mm -hmm. uh, maybe Sarah, has, do you guess maybe you can put this in an email or next session if there's been any interest or people saying oh I'm going to submit I mean it sounds like everyone's submitting this round because of you know because of that but yeah to, anyone to know, that, that I was even vaguely aware of might be thinking of submitting an application this fiscal year I right. advise them to come in this round because of the right. amount of applications that we were looking at so I, I'm not aware of anybody coming in yeah is there a history of cutting it off at the beginning rather than I mean, now rather than I, I don't believe in in my tenure here, and Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong, that we have ever full, we have ever not gone to a second, second round. Point. But there's is, no policy that says not, we have to. Uh, no, we and we have we less want. money now than we have had in correct in, in okay. so it's a new it's a new story really with the kind of money we have. Yes. Mm -hmm. But if we I mean round numbers, if we have if we leave half a million dollars or so next round we know there's gonna be two and a half million dollars worth of applications that are, are yeah. automatically going to yeah, come no, forward yeah. i don't see the yes, i don't know if i see the point of no no i'm pushing, I, you know, but mm -hmm. maybe there is i don't know yeah i agree any other uh, comments yeah, that that uh number that the reverend used to reference mm -hmm. um housing 17.4 or whatever yeah. or mm -hmm. where does that come from Fair. that would be one of my questions so our financial report is online. That's right? that's what that is. For? Yeah, there's okay. a there's a nice little pie chart, mm -hmm. okay. and I believe that is the most up to date number. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. So that was accurate. The figure seventy. I believe so. Yes. Yeah. Once again, I was just so impressed with every single yeah, person. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was not you know you really come here with some trepidation because some people are so frightened and so scared, and we knew that there were a couple folks who mm -hmm. who need a little assist there. But my goodness, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I was, it was just a, a person after person. I mean, it was, they were, no one went on and on. No one really repeated what was said. It was, I thought it was really amazing. thoughtful comments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember having such a full house, maybe for um, Florence Fields, where we had, you know, about a zillion kids. Sometimes it's really heavy on one or two applications. Yeah. But this, but this was, was really split. I mean, the, the, the church had a few more than <laughs> yeah. so that just makes it all the harder. Yeah. 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 But I just I'm so impressed yeah. with how again how wonderful people were. And, yeah. Have you ever yeah. had public comment or I was struck that nobody said no. Nobody's against anything. <laughs> Is there yeah. it's, I mean, it's I wonder rare if it's a publicity that people don't know about it unless they're like someone advocating. came once, maybe, to speak yeah. against the CPA in general, but people yeah. don't. Actually, I, don't I, I think they're not willing to stand up in front of group of, in front of a group of supporters. I think we had a couple yeah. against Pulaski Park, didn't we? There was just too much money. We shouldn't be doing this. Yeah, yeah. It's fine the way it is, uh, but it's very rare to have those come up, yeah. and it we, would be hard. I mean, to come up here and speak against affordable right, housing. Sure. I mean, it, right. mm -hmm. it would be courageous. To Do we have any policies about ongoing funding of salaries? That that's, will be, a, I think, a good part of our uh, discussion when we look at the community housing support services. Because yeah. we, we really struggled with that three, three years three ago years when years we ago. funded them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and the uh, expectation was that they would, they, would, yeah. they would be coming back with additional yeah. sources. I guess the other, um, apropos 
to the initial question. I think um, we should also look to see if you know we don't support something if it's actually going to kill the project. Will it not happen? Because it seems that a lot, of, some especially in the housing realm, they have a lot of other sources of funding coming through. So if we don't support it, or we, fund, we support it partially. Is that going to kill the project completely? Because I don't think we would want to do something that we were in support of. Um, but couldn't fund entirely um, the project. And, and Martha, as a new person, remember that partial funding is always an option. We do that yeah. this constantly. We do not have to fund what they're requesting. Right. How long can we, ca we carry over the money on the courthouse? We're now carrying over money on Sergeant housing yeah, how long is there a history of how long money like that gets carried over hoping to to find the right match or building is there any limit on that well, we have a three year limit that yeah. has to be spent it has to okay yeah. it, people very rarely come back for contract extensions and when they do it's usually the money is almost gone and we just have a few projects mm -hmm. that we're looking to complete and this mm -hmm. is why i don't think for a large project like that where this is the first dollar in that anybody's ever given so, but we, but it's being carried now without, I mean, they didn't have the money, so we were just putting it in, hoping that they were going to get, a, a, again, the sergeant house, uh -huh. hoping they were going to get it. Uh, we could do that again, and then if it didn't happen, let it go. Is that how it would yes. work? Okay. If it didn't happen, we would get it back, just like we get that 50000 yeah. back if we put nothing else into sergeant house. Yeah. Oh, that 50,000 would have yeah, But I guess my question was how long? Three years Three I'm years. hearing. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Thank you. Good to go. Is there a motion to adjourn? Mm -hmm. yeah, second. Second. Uh,